don't ever be afraid to participate. Always show up and always add to the conversation because leaders don't sit back, right? They participate actively in what's going on. And if you if you pull that out and generalize it beyond just tech leadership, right? Just beyond participating in the boardroom, there's also things like participate in your community and have a say for what your community is like. Participate in the groups that you're in so that the groups are doing the things that are important to you and align with your values and morals. Welcome to the Leaders in Tech podcast. Uh, this is the best technology and business podcast in the market. We opened this podcast because we realized that there is very little on the internet about leadership pertaining to do with technology. And I think it's a huge disservice in the world because if you notice what has been propelling the human race in the last 100 years, especially in the last 50 years, is technology. And technology is only be, being created by humans for humans' benefit. And that requires leadership. And nobody's talking about that. So it is my job to shine the light and show the world how it's done. So with us today, we have Adam, brother. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Really appreciate you inviting me to be here. Uh, you know, Adam, I have been doing podcasting for over three years now. I've been blessed to have so much uh, wisdom through people like you. Um, one of the things that I don't do is a, it's a very unorthodox podcast. I never send questions. Uh, and I, or if I send questions, I never ask the same questions. <laughs> And I never give a biography of my guests because I want people to know the true human behind the scenes. Uh, so for the audience, what's your full name? Where do you live and what do you do for a living? Uh, my name is Adam Scheinberg. I live in Orlando, Florida, where I have been for about 20 years. And um, I do lots of things for a living. My job, the one that uh, pays me, is I'm the vice president of IT for a company called Massey Services. We're one of the largest uh, pest control and laundry and shrub care companies in the United States, family owned. That's beautiful. Now you say you had to do many things. Tell me other things. What other things do you do? <laughs> I I am a um, I, I'm I'm somebody who's always on the go, and I can't seem to say no to things. Um, something that I'm learning to get better at, but I am involved in a number of nonprofit organizations. I just finished a um, um, roughly six year run as the president of an organization called the Mockingbird Foundation, which raises money for music and arts education for children. Um, fantastic organization with less than 1% overhead. Um, and that's been one of the highlights of, of my career to serve uh, as the lead of that organization. I'm the chair of a local um, theater for young audiences known as the Orlando Repertory Theater. And um, I will wrap up my chairmanship in the next couple of, uh, well, two months or so. And that has also been tremendously rewarding because my daughter was so motivated and, and, and subsequently my son, both of them have been on the stage there. And what a great growth experience from, for me and truly my whole family along the way. Um, and there's a few other things that I've been involved in, most notably and perhaps most relevantly. Um, in the last few years, I helped form something called the Orlando Tech Council, which was recently renamed the Orlando Tech Community. It's an attempt to take a town like Orlando that is young comparatively um, with a relatively young tech community, not in terms of the people, but rather in terms of the presence of high tech in central florida um, and build a community here so that we can uh, lean on each other and that we have great resources and that we can help recruit great uh, technicians to the area that we can develop the leadership that you're talking about that's missing in a lot of places um, so i served as the inaugural chair and there have been a few chairs since then and it just continues to grow and what an honor to be involved in that kind of stuff that's beautiful congratulations i can see your big heart uh, yeah. just like that. And now, now, I, now I know why your last name is Scheinberg, 
because you're shining right. all the time. <laughs> <laughs> and you live in the sunshine state too, right? <laughs> That's right. You got it. <laughs> you know, in our society nowadays, it's so easy for kids to, to, to get lost in video games, in doing the wrong things. And you supporting the arts um, helps a lot. Um, I th believe arts and sports and also technology, like kids that do summer camps in technology or things like that, the more you put uh, the youth through programs that focuses them on something good, the less time they have to do something bad. So congratulations on that. Thank you. And, you know, I'll say this, and I really mean it, and I don't mean it to sound pretentious, but I don't think it's that far to go from art to music to technology. They're all in my opinion, just slightly different variations of perspective. Um, I think of music as like fancy art as well. And I think technology, the problem solving that's involved there, the complexity in managing things, not unlike managing time signatures of music in your head, it just feels like natural partners, like they align. And so um, thank you for, for saying that. and. I'm a huge believer in arts education. So, um, yeah, I, I would consider that one of the, the core drivers of my participation in service outside of my company. Beautiful. You know, and you're actually right. My two kids are grown up and they are both in technology and they are both singer songwriters. So you're completely right. There is the connectivity, you know, like people that have math majors, they tend to play the piano, for example. Right? right? I believe it's the same circuitry in the brain that is required to do both, right? You got it. I'm, I'm right there with you. Fabulous. And also, what an example for the listeners, for the, for the people that are aspiring to be leaders in technology. You guys got to take this as an example. When you're a true leader, you can be a true leader anywhere, not just in technology. And your life gets fulfilled by serving in other capacities, not just on your full-time job. Uh, what a beautiful example. Thank you so much, Alan, for that. Uh, David, let me just, let me support that by saying tech people, especially all, all industries, but tech people, especially tend to, um, congregate with other tech people and form really a hyper-focused community. So I encourage other tech leaders to get involved outside of technology and the community because there is so much breadth to any society and just building bonds with other tech people doesn't really advance your career and your presence and your network and your connectivity the way that um, getting involved in something that might be uh, unexpected or, or atypical uh, might. So, Wonderful. Now let's yeah. see how, how you became the amazing leader that you are. Let's look back in time. <laughs> let's put yourself back in high school, the last year of high school. What was your, in your mind? What did you decide to do with your life right after you graduated? Um, well, you, uh, I appreciate that. Interesting question, not one I've been asked before. So when I graduated high school and for the first three years of college, I was 100% convinced that I was going to be an attorney. Uh, my father was, and I, I am a writer, and I just sort of felt like that was my destiny. Uh, and I built my entire educational path based on that. Um, partway through college, I pivoted to a psychology major and an English minor, and those felt particularly well suited to go to law school. I even made it so far as uh, taking the LSATs my senior year and preparing applications for law schools. And uh, although I'd like to say it was on the way to the mailbox because that would be more poetic, in, in reality, it was as I was prepping the application process. And I started to think, is that really what I want to do? Do I really want to go back to school for a couple of years? And am I really passionate about this? And I kind of made a last minute decision that despite building towards that my whole childhood, that that was not what I was going to do. And uh, yeah, I, I shot out into the great wide open without a plan. So you had no plan. <laughs> I, awesome. I graduated. I, I got a job um, working in defense contracting, um, which was really just sort of I had relationships and 
I got to do some cool things. I got to work in the Pentagon in D.C. Um, I got to get some government experience. And eventually I started to look around and say, I think I might kind of have a knack for some computer stuff. And it was early days, you know, we were using like Windows 98 and people didn't really know much about computers, but I felt very comfortable with them. And so I started to study and I enrolled in some courses. And um, yeah, from there, it just snowballed into more and more help desk and then call center leadership. And it just kind of exponentially grew from there. All right. Wait, wait, wait. So you were working as a psychologist for the Pentagon. And then uh, not, not psychologist. I was just I was just doing basic, uh, you know, PowerPoint slides and and uh, I don't know the kinds of things an intern might do, but then a little more than that as time went on. So a junior job after having your degree, right? You got it. From there, you get in, you get inclined with computer science. You go back to school, get some courses, and what was your first job in IT? I had a fraternity brother, believe it or not, who called me and said. Uh, we're really looking for some people to, to help us on a help desk project working for the U.S. Navy. Would you have any interest? I wasn't thrilled about the commute, but the pay sounded good. So I took the interview and I got the job pretty much on the spot. Um, and that that was it. I started out uh, supporting uh, a directorate of the U.S. Navy. And uh, that job had some uh, stickiness and some velocity. So I became the senior tech and then I became the call center manager. Um, all within, I would say, probably the first 12 to 18 months. That is, that's, that's fast. Did you get trained on your job? Like, did you get trained on what you were supposed to do? Or did you have to I got figure that out? Yeah, I got a good amount of training about Uh, what we were doing in the help desk. So I understood the network and I understand the computers and I started to learn what the common problems that users would have would be. Um, but by that point, I had already had some leadership roles in my college. I was a uh, class president and I was involved in my fraternity leadership. And so I felt like I could start to see some some trends in terms of how to get people motivated and how to get them to buy into a common mission. And uh, I, I frequently feel like people are fed garbage in terms of what they're supposed to believe. And you can earn credibility very quickly by just being authentic and honest with people um, and getting people to buy into things that they aren't particularly excited about, but they can see value in is not tremendously hard if you remember certain things about working with people and what motivates people. And so I think being able to wrangle a call center and get people on board and working towards a common goal was a big part of why people said we should give him additional responsibility. We should allow him to lead people. So uh, without getting ahead of you, I made the jump actually from leading a call center to working on the network engineering team and then leading that team, which is not a, not a common path. Um, but I have I have some war stories about how that happened and how I became a leader. I'm here that. to listen. And by the way, for the audience, you absolutely do not require a computer science degree to become a leader in technology. And this is a clear example of that. What, what is required of you is the passion for technology, but most importantly, the passion to lead people towards a better future. Because that's at the end. I, I could not agree more. And let me give you a specific example of that. So from the call center team, I, I had built this call center to be larger than the original scope. Uh, we were doing a lot of, I would say, tier three work at the tier one level because I had convinced everybody we were just moving work that would have gone to a sysad team off, off of their plate and resolving it at first contact. Um, so when I was moved over to this team and then told I was going to be leading it, and I was just a kid who was, you know, 25 years old, leading a team of senior sysadmins who had a lot more experience than I did, I knew that even though they were my friends, that there was some uh, heartburn about me 
becoming their boss for a lack of a better term. I gathered everyone in the room. I said, uh, listen, you know me and I know you, and I know that you feel like putting me in charge is a weird choice. So let's just get some things on the table. First off, I don't know as much as you, and I'm not here to uh, be the person who has the most knowledge, but I, I am here to try to build a team that's working toward a goal. So floor is open. We got 30 minutes. Take every shot you want at me. But when we walk out of this room, we're a team again. Um, I don't know that when I said, I thought, I thought I had confidence about that. I don't know that I was prepared for them to be quite as aggressive as they were. Um, but in retrospect, it was a really grow up moment in my career um, where people who I had known for a couple of years um, took some shots. You know, you, you don't deserve a role like this. You haven't paid your dues. You don't know enough to lead a team like this. It's going to be short term. You know, I was very much put on the spot and didn't expect it. My recollection is that I was almost like choking back tears in the meeting because I was not anticipating uh, all of that. But at the end of it, I said to them, everybody got a chance to say what they wanted to say. My door is open, but, we, but, but, but for now, I lead this team and we've got a mission. And um, if you got a problem, come see me. Otherwise, we're moving forward. And uh, I'll tell you what, we moved forward and it all was good. And, and if I just had to swallow a half an hour of, of discomfort to make that happen, that was worth it. You know, I, you remind, this story reminds me of something that I just watched on TV. Uh, do you know this senior pastor called uh, Charles Stanley? No. Okay, so this guy just passed away three, four days ago. He mm -hmm. was a pastor for 70 years. His last, uh, his, his last job assignment was being the pastor for, I think it's the, um, the Baptist Church in Atlanta. He was a young person pastoring maybe, you know, churches of three, four hundred, five hundred people. And he goes in here as an associate pastor. So a pastor is a leader too, right? So that's why I'm talking about this. And it's very similar sure. to your story. And uh, the church is 3,000 people. And, but he's not the senior pastor, he's the associate pastor. So he's almost like the vice president, right? Time goes by, senior pastor resigns, and the board has to make a choice whether they put this guy as the senior pastor. But he was very young, and he had never led so many people. And, you know, through prayer and, and, and guidance, you know, he says the Lord showed him that that was the place he wanted him to be, but it was, wasn't going to be easy. And they had a town hall meeting and uh, a lot of people came up, like these people like you, and they started bashing him. You don't have enough experience. You don't know what you're doing. This is not of God. And he's just stood still and he never defended himself. At the end of the whole story, he actually, the church votes, votes him in. So they had everybody voted and he became the senior pastor. But the conflict didn't stop there because the people that were against him, they started to make a revolt. So to make the long story short, the 3,000 people church went down to 300 people. They had less people in the whole church than they had in the choir. Imagine that. But time went by and the 3,000 people became more than that. So the church expanded. Then he created something called In Touch Ministries, where he actually joined with the U.S. Army and they created these tiny devices with scriptures recorded as with voice. So when the army went, they will distribute these devices in the language of the country to provide ministry. So that's how far this guy went. But it's because he was bold enough to stand his ground, had enough confidence to do it, and enough humility not to fight back. And that's what I hear from you. <laughs> humility, confidence, and boldness. <laughs> <laughs> so, oddly enough, I think it, it can go two ways. It can go the way in your story where people leave, but then you stick to it and they come back. But the other way it can go is that people exhaust their frustration. They get it out of their system and then they've been heard and they've been validated on those things. And now they move on. And uh, both of those, I think, are very different experiences for a leader. 
but they both highlight the same thing, which is when there's unrest or there's um, conflict or tension, you have to address it in some form or fashion. And ultimately what people want when they're um, unhappy is to be heard. And you've got to give them that opportunity to be heard. Yeah. And I think it, it, it goes a long way. When people express themselves, they just release their emotions. And sometimes that's enough just to to let, let the storm go through, right? Yeah, exactly. How long did you stay there <laughs> as a leader of the Hunters? <laughs> so, <laughs> no, um... they, they was, they was in, the, in the networking uh, department already, right? Yeah, so I was I was working for the Navy for a grand total of about four years. Um, and I left primarily because D.C. is sort of a transient place. I was ready to go somewhere warmer, and I was ready to find a place that I could really put down roots. And uh, for very strange reasons, I chose Orlando um, at a very strange time. But now I couldn't be happier that this is where I landed. So, so you uh, you actually yeah, made the conscious choice. Were, were you uh, were you married already or not yet? Nope, I didn't meet my wife until 2005, um, and now we have you know uh, our home is here. Our children have grown up here, mm -hmm. and uh, I think it'd be very difficult to get us to leave Central Florida. What an interesting choice for a for a young professional leader to choose Orlando. <laughs> what what was right. in your mind? <laughs> well, everybody who doesn't live in Florida will assume that if you come to Orlando, what you really are coming to is Disney World. Mm -hmm. um, and while Disney is a huge part of the identity of Central Florida, it's really, it's not even really in Orlando. And it isn't what I think of when I think of Orlando. I see Orlando as having all the components to be whatever the next kind of Silicon Valley or Denver or, or Austin is going to be, um, regardless of what your thoughts are on the metaverse and whether that's what will even be called, mm -hmm. um, the components that form the core of that, a lot of them really find their home in Orlando. The University of Central Florida is here churning out some of the most amazing engineering students Uh, this is really the birthplace of the next generation of LiDAR companies like um, uh, Luminar that are making what are effectively the eyes for self-driving cars are located here right down the road next to UCF. Uh, we've got fintech innovation here. We have a unicorn company called Stax that is born and bred in Orlando. Uh, we are doing a ton with AR and VR both at UCF and we have a, a school down the road here called Full Sail that does um, uh, a ton of multimedia stuff. So anytime you see the Oscars, even though you may be looking at uh, best acting awards, the truth is all the production awards, there's always 20, 30, 40 students who graduated from Full Sail, which wow. is here in Orlando. Um, so Florida as a whole, regardless of your view of the state, especially right now in Miami, you've got all the blockchain stuff happening in, in central Florida. You have all of this optics and, uh, AR VR stuff happening. And, you know, you see the building blocks of the next generation of technology happening here. Now, the truth is, and we're going to keep this in the cone of silence between you and me and all of your listeners. Um, <laughs> It's, it's a happy accident because I didn't know any of that was going to happen here when I chose Orlando as the place I was going to live. But there is a hundred percent overlap. That is a big part of why I am staying here and happy here because what's happening in tech around here is exciting. And uh, there are really cool people who have great, bold ideas. And we're getting there. Soon we'll have more um, venture capital here. We're working on that as well. And um, Orlando's going to be a force. You're going to hear more about it over the next You know what? It makes, it makes sense. If you look at what's happened with Silicon Valley, and this is not a political show, by the way. This is a, a leadership show. But having said that, though, the conditions for Florida, the way the government runs there, is attracting a ton of people. And it's because there's more freedom. It's, there is more um, backing for entrepreneurs. And that's what drives economies. 
business drives economies, especially business in technology. I remember during the pandemic, I went to Florida. I went. I was in Orlando and Miami for about three months in 2021, just because my country was locked down and I couldn't hold, handle it anymore. And I'm blessed that I can work remotely, thanks to technology. And uh, I was looking to buy a condo in Orlando, not in Orlando, sorry, in Miami, about in 2018. When I saw the same property, 2021, it was three times the price and it kept growing. And so I started asking what's going on. And they said, everybody from California is moving to Florida. Everybody from uh, New York is moving to Florida. <laughs> yeah, well, we do have, um, we do like any city, we have challenges and affordable housing is one of them because Orlando is spread wide. Um, and it, it can be an hour long drive to get to the Northern part of greater Orlando to the Southern part and the east to the west um so that's something we're gonna have to work on but uh but people are moving here like something like a thousand people a week into central florida wow um and uh you know that rate has been continued for a long period of time the orlando international airport is the most trafficked airport in the united states um so there are there are people who want to come here it has uh, it's taxation friendly. So when you talk about, you know, why Florida is a destination, it's warm. Um, and there are, uh, entertainment options and there are beaches and it, it, the cost of living is significantly lower. And I'm from the Northeast originally, and I love the Northeast and I love the Northwest. And truthfully, I think the Southwest is beautiful. I have no, uh, ax to grind with any part of this country, but I understand why people want to come here. And if you don't believe me or my rationale, just look at the numbers because Florida is growing by even a faster number. I, I want to say I've read something like a couple thousand new residents per day move into Florida, That's uh, which doesn't sound like a ton until you add it up over the course of a year, you know? It's crazy. And now that explains why the real estate prices are skyrocketing there, right? It's yep. like, it, doesn't, yep. it doesn't seem to slow either. Right. And it's because the influx of people. You got it. Isn't it beautiful that we live in a place in the world, but people are free just to take off and move wherever they want. What a blessing. Yeah. And I couldn't agree more. You know, now that I, you know, now you have this global economy and, and, uh, the more I see, uh, what's going on in the world, the more I value freedom, the more I value entrepreneurship, the more I value technology. And of course, all that is thanks to leadership, right? So going back to, to your life, uh, what job did you get in Florida first? So um, I came to Florida. I had a couple thousand dollars in my pocket. I was in my mid twenties. I felt I was rich. <laughs> so I took, <laughs> I took like a month to sit by the pool. Um, and I opened the paper and I applied to a few jobs and I was offered two positions, um, one working for a small resort um, out towards Disney World uh, and one working for a regional pest control company in North Orlando, Maitland, Florida. And uh, I thought it sounded better to work at the pest control company, better dry in the morning. So I took the job and uh, that was 20 years ago next month. Congratulations. You know, that, that shows also incredible leadership. Um, you know, that doesn't happen anymore. People change jobs every two years and now it's even faster, right? Mm -hmm. uh, what was your role when you started? I started as systems manager, overseeing all technology for the entire company. I had one person on my team um, and he and I managed the entire company when I came in, it was, um, you know, I want to say it was a mess, but I, I kind of feel like that's with the knowledge that I have since then. Um, it was the kind of network and, and IT infrastructure that was built by uh, a company that had one person running it for a long time. Mm -hmm. So um, there was a lot of work to do. When I took over, it was like this: the state of things were so messy that we would have to stop in the middle of the day to reboot all the Citrix servers and kick everyone out yeah. <laughs> just to be able to be operational. Uh, so I wanted to spend a lot of money right away because we were just dramatically undersized and under-resourced. 
That's incredible. And so you actually saw the growth of the business. Now you say it's the largest uh, pest control company in the, in, in the States, right? Uh, not the largest, but the largest family owned. That's amazing. Uh, wow. So, so <laughs> yeah, when, when I started, I do remember us celebrating that we were going to cross $30 million in revenue. Mm -hmm. And um, this year will probably be closer to 370 360 something yeah that's more so, than x more yeah. than that's right and huge acquisitions along the way it's been you know i started with a team of one now i have almost 30 on the team amazing um, and tons more responsibility obviously because we've the it department has swallowed things that uh existed on the fringe of it but also does a lot of things that didn't exist 20 years ago you know nobody knew the terms business intelligence or analytics or anything like that back then or, AI, or at least right? yeah not normal yeah exactly oh <laughs> uh, that's incredible uh did you ever get any formal training on leadership um i've had lots of individual kind of one day classes and um i took part in something called leadership orlando which is um a leadership program that is one of the largest in the u.s uh, about 7500 graduates um, and not only did I get to do that Leadership Orlando program, I got to take part in something that they came up with called Leadership Orlando 2.0, uh, which was more of a hands-on, get involved in the community thing. There have only been two classes of that. And believe it or not, uh, next month I will wrap up my third run through, but this time chairing the class. So nice. I'm chairing a class of about a hundred professionals, some already established running their own company some senior executives, some just next generation leaders. Um, it's a tremendous experience and humbling to be uh, working with that many established leaders through our community. Great networking also. That's amazing, you know, and what a beautiful way to live life in your own terms. Um, and that's the reward of true leadership. I haven't met a leader that is not happy if it's a good leader. And it's because to you're leading other people, but the first person you need to lead is yourself, isn't it? So that if you, you lead it. yourself through, towards the right towards the right path, you're going to be fulfilled, right? I do <laughs> tell my I tell my family Orlando has been good to us, and we should be good back to Orlando. Mm -hmm. When I do these things in the community, my family also pays a price in some form or fashion, either by covering for me when I'm not there, or by participating when I drag them to the to support the uh, organizations that I support, or by all of us participating because it's another cause that's important to someone else in the family. So, um, yeah, everybody is really fully involved and understands the importance of contributing to our community. What would you tell the version of you that was just about to leave the Pentagon? If you had up time machine and you could go back and say hey brother listen <laughs> that person so i do keep this this sort of list of of things i found myself saying over the years over and over again um if i had to go, go back and give myself advice i i don't think it would be any of the things that i routinely repeat um, that I that I think are worth sharing, but for me, it would probably be something along the lines of don't ever be afraid to participate. Always show up and always add to the conversation because leaders don't sit back, right? They participate actively in what's going on. And if you if you pull that out and generalize it beyond just tech leadership, right? Just beyond participating in the boardroom, there's also things like participate in your community and have a say for what your community is like. Participate in the groups that you're in so that the groups are doing the things that are important to you and align with your values and morals. Participate whether whether it's in the services provided by your community because they give you appreciation for what's happening around there. Participate with your children and show up to the things that they find are important because they know that you're there they remember those things and feel supported over time so yeah i think my answer is just remember to show up and add to the conversation that's beautiful that's so nice which leads me to the last 
question of this interview because I do appreciate your time and I don't want to abuse it. If you had access, and this is not only for leadership, it's for general in life. If you had access to a billboard in front of the busiest highway on earth, what would you write in that billboard? Um, if so, oddly enough, I was just on a billboard <laughs> as part really? of this. Uh, yeah, as part of this leadership Orlando, I was on a billboard, and, and let me just tell you. Uh, both because it's relevant, but also to give myself a few seconds to think about the answer. I can't tell you how many people saw the billboards and how, how effective they ended up being. For months after they came down, people would say, I saw you on a billboard yesterday. Wow. And I would say, you mean in August. <laughs> but, um, but billboards are hugely effective. So that just makes the question all that much more important. If I wrote something on a billboard, what would it be? Because I know people are going to see it. So I think the, the, and I think I even said this to you earlier today, the, the message I would send to people is remember to be authentic. Mm. People sense authenticity. They know when you're real and when you're real with people, that's when you can lead. That's when people have faith in you yeah. and you can't, I have to be honest. I don't think you can fake it people sense when it's really you it's so I, I think that's wow. i think that's probably the message i would give that's so profound if people were authentic in the world we wouldn't have all these wars and all this crazy stuff going on you know and it's completely true because if you are putting a fake version of yourself people notice like this you yeah. know it's like can you see the wind no but you can hear the wind and you can feel it coming and going. It's the same with authenticity. You don't see it, but you can feel it. And sooner or later, you'll get found out. And there's not a way to live life. Because also, I believe when you're not authentic, you're putting up lies. And then you need to create another lie to cover that lie. And it becomes a chain. And that chain gets you into, into bondage. And it's a horrible... I mean, right? If you... If you... This is, you mentioned this is not a political show, but people look at politicians and government leaders and they, I believe, almost nobody believes what anybody says here. Uh, you know, they vote on emotion and they vote on all kinds of things. But if you look smaller than that, right, um, people do want authenticity in leaders. And that is what they look for with a boss in the job. That's what they look for in a CEO of a company or a leader of a department. They they do sense that. And so it is really important if you're trying to build a career, particularly one in leadership, for people to have faith and trust in you and to believe that your purpose aligns with their purpose, especially the next generation that is so um, committed to working for companies that align with their values and morals. So... Um, yeah, I think I can safely double down on that message. Beautiful. Um, Adam, it was an honor sharing this time with you. Thank you so much. People like to find out more about you or ask you questions on leadership and technology. Where can they find you? Uh, they can find me at adamscheinberg.com, A-D-A-M-S-C-H-E-I-N-B-E-R-G.com. Um, and they can track me down on all the socials. Uh, LinkedIn for sure, usually, right? <laughs> usually under the name Seth Adam One. Beautiful. Um, thank you so much, brother. God bless you and have a beautiful rest of the week. Thank you so much, David. Thank you for tuning in to the Leaders in Tech podcast. Check in next week to keep learning how to use technology and leadership to change the game. See you next time.